Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, as ever, to the front pages of the newspapers, and in a sense it's pointless because there is only one story, but there's still interesting things to say. There's the Sunday Times going on this question of whether or not um, people have been hiding amongst the migrants coming into Europe. Interesting, they, have, they usually have a huge wadge of brightly coloured kind of advertising, advertorial at the top of the paper, worth a lot of money to them, and they have got rid of it so they have a sober, serious-looking front page. That's a wealthy newspaper for you. There's the Observer. Three ISIS terror squads were launched launched the wave of the Paris attacks that killed 129 people. Um, the Sunday Express there, they say the SAS are on our streets as Paris weeps. I may ask the Home Secretary about that. I'd like to give me an answer. I often attack the Independent Sunday for its front pages, but it has a great one today, simply the trickler and some serious, serious words, an absolutely model front page. Um, there's the sun, finally. Look at my eyes, then die. It says some harrowing accounts of, of what's going on what happened on the streets of Paris. And finally, the Sunday Telegraph is a very interesting story there about the numbers of people who have been out to Syria and then come back to this country and may be considered suspect people. Now, what we're going to try to do today with the three of you is go through today's papers and tell people what is new, because, of course, a lot of people have seen all of this on the TV and feel, what can the newspapers add? And the truth is, the newspapers can add quite a bit. So we're going to start with, with Amal, I think, with the Sunday Telegraph. Yeah, so there's this line, you mentioned this on the front of the Sunday um, Times as well, but this is a nice write-up in the Sunday um, Telegraph about this idea that two of the potential suspects came to the EU through Greece. One of the suspects had a Syrian passport um, very, very near him. I think it was uh, belonged to that suspect. And, of course, this raises fears that with huge numbers of refugees coming into Europe, something like 10,000 a day into Germany, there might be um, many other suspects that are coming and in And this was as, as recently well. as October. It was the 3rd of October and it came through a Greek uh, place called Leros. And, of course, people are very concerned not just about the, the danger that there are suspects or people who are sympathetic to ISIS coming in, but also what happens to these people once they do come in, which, of course, alienated, unemployed, second-generation immigrants, um, I say that as one, uh, are often susceptible to violence and, and so radicalisation. This, this, is, this is another... Um, as it were, front line in the war of ISIS. They actually hit the immigrants, the, yeah. the, 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 the refugees coming in because of what's going on in Syria. Yeah, it's very and easy they, for they them to hammer them through. again because they make Europe more hostile to them. Yes, exactly. It's very, it seems that it's, I mean, you know, with the numbers that are coming through, it seems very, very easy for them to basically hitch a ride um, and enter Europe. And it looks like two so of the suspects of France. Does this too. vindicate slightly Cameron's stance on saying controlled uh, immigration from the camps rather than the Angela mm. Merkel? Frank, you've got a story. This is the whole question of the European, how mm. secure Europe's borders are. You've got the independent on Sunday there, right? Yeah, <clears throat> it says exactly that. Europe's border policy faces fresh scrutiny. And it's one of the quotes that stands out here is from a German minister, a Bavarian finance minister, who says, the days of unchecked immigration can't go on. Paris changes everything. I think th there is a danger of overreacting here. But a lot of people are going to be saying, look, the idea that somebody can just drive across from Belgium into France mm. or from Germany into France with a boot, car boot full of weapons completely unchecked is probably over or at least needs to be looked mm. at again. Mm. And Britain is slightly different, separate from this, not just because it's an island, but because it's not part of Schengen. So in security terms, we're in a different place. So not some, some people won't know what Schengen is, bizarrely, I'm Frank. sorry, yes, of course. Oh, sorry. Amazingly. Yeah, no, well, actually, Rodan, you explain. Well, Schengen, Schengen is a, a commitment um, that was made in a Luxembourgish place called Schengen um, over 30 years ago towards free movement, basically, and the Schengen Treaty. I'm amazed in, I noticed. If you're this. inside Schengen, you can move from one country to another without yep. being stopped but by Britain anybody. is not part, part, not part of Schengen, of so it, yeah. it does, the, the, the yeah. rules that apply to the rest of the EU don't apply here. What it means, I mean, leave aside the politics of it, but simply in terms of arms control, it means that it's harder to get powerful automatic weapons like Kalashnikovs that have been used twice this year in Paris, it's harder to get them into the UK. Not impossible, and there's still the Northern Ireland connection, mm. but it's much harder. It's one of the reasons why they think that we haven't yet faced a marauding attack, or yes. what's called an MPTA, a multi-pronged terrorist assault, such as we've just seen in Paris here in Britain. Mm. One of the other things that's clear from today's papers, Jane, mm. is that there were serious intelligence failures in yes. France. You picked up, I think it was a Mail on, a mail on Sunday The Mail story on Sunday, way. yeah. Um, I mean, as Frank's just mentioned there, uh, German police um, apparently uncovered an arsenal of weapons in a car and didn't tell anti-terror chiefs. 
um, the heavily armed suspect was on his way to Paris. Uh, one of the terrorists was a Parisian who'd been on a terror watch list for five years but was not being monitored closely enough uh, before he took part in the attack. And the Greek authorities believe that, as you mentioned, one of the, uh, one of the attackers was Syria, opposing as a refugee from Syria. But again, you know, and we have here um, a spokeswoman for France's ruling Socialist Party said obviously there was a failure of intelligence. I feel slightly sorry for the, uh, the nebulous uh, intelligence exactly. because you know, every time they try and get greater powers everyone sort of says no 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 it's a you know, police state we can't have this and then when something like this happens mm. the first bit of blame gets laid at their door saying that they didn't do enough. So they have, to, be, they have to get place. it right every time don't they? They yeah. have to be right consistently and they don't always yeah. get recognition for when they do get it right. You know, so, something I don't understand I'm going to ask Frank about this mm. is whether the French state's powers of interception and surveillance are roughly the same as our government's or are they different? Do we know? Um, <clears throat> I think they're different. Um, They've been very tough on terrorism, probably tougher than we were since 1995, because they had the sort of the first recent modern wave of terrorism that they suffered was in the mid 90s with people from what was called the GIA, which was an Algerian militant group that carried out bombings in Paris and Lyon. And they were very cross at Britain that some of the people that they were hunting simply crossed the channel and sought refuge in Britain. And oh, at I the time, that, Britain yes. was a bit kind of, ah, oh, well, you know, they've not broken any laws here, so let them, you know. And actually, in retrospect, that was a mistake. So Britain and France are now pretty much hand in glove. You know, British intelligence has people embedded in French intelligence and vice versa. And the police have sent a team over yesterday to work with the French. That's mm. fascinating. Now, um, one of the problems, Amor, a newspaper editor, uh, a story like this is much easier in a way for TV because we show the moving pictures, we show people screaming in the streets, we have big graphics of the maps mm. and so on. But one of the jobs of a newspaper on a day like this is to give their readers a clear overview of how it And you've got an example of that being Fantastic done quite well example. here. Obviously the other thing was that the story broke very late for us on Friday night, which means that lots of papers struggled to get this kind of overview into Saturday's papers, so they had a big hit um, today. And I think a, a pay rise would be deserved for the guys at the Mail on Sunday graphics desk who've got just this most fantastic spread on um, on just the anarchy that unfolded which gives a very strong um, mm. indication not only of the horror that people experienced but also the fact that these were obviously coordinated attacks it was yes. obviously very well They've got a very planned. good graphic of the theatre which the I theater hadn't with, seen on television with the actually. gunmen entering at the back near mm. a bar where people are obviously having drinks and I think the thing that's really striking about this is that there's this wonderful line from a, a novel that we've both read Andrew called um, The Secret Agent by Joseph Conrad where he says that if terrorism is going to be effective it's got to be directed against the spirit of the age 9-11 was, um, and that was based and on... And this is terrorism in 1906? No, it was, it, was 18, it was an attack on the Greenwich Royal Observatory in 1894. The novel came out in 1907. But 9-11 yeah, was an attack against... 9-11 um, was an attack against capitalism, the Twin Towers. This was an attack against the way of life that expresses yeah. enlightenment Normal values. Normal people. Normal people on yeah. a Friday night, in a restaurant, yeah. in cafes, in theatres, going to a rock concert. Which, of yeah. course, is the nature of how terrorism works, because it places into all of our minds that that could have been us with our families. Yeah. Um, and then the knock-on mm. effect of that. But mm. I think newspapers, this is where they set themselves apart from social media. That's right. Um, is because social media has the immediacy of being able to talk about this but not necessarily check the facts. So it's perspective newspapers, and it's... Yeah. yeah. And getting it right, authority. You know, there's there two stories on Friday night. There's what's happening on social media, which was incredibly instant and fast. Yeah. And then what um, Jeremy Corbyn disparagingly calls the mainstream uh, media, what Sarah Palin used to call the lamestream media. We were much slower. That's because we had to get our facts right. And the, day, the Mail on Sunday, <laughs> yeah. the Mail on Sunday seems to have got its facts right this morning in a fantastic spread. And then, and then, Frank, there is the whole question of the Muslim communities in France and Belgium feeling pretty besieged this morning, I'm sure. Well, some of them will be, and I think this is the really dangerous thing, um, that there could be a sort of backlash. I mean, the trouble is when you have something like this, it can lead, it, it can appeal to the sort of base instincts with some people who go and blame an entire community or an entire religion. Um, mm. And, you know, th this is, we're at a really dangerous stage here, I think, where, you know, migrants, Muslims, anybody is going to get blamed, lumped in with these awful people who are condemned by those very communities. And I think it's just mm. so important to make that to, absolutely... To distinguish. To distinguish that. Yes, it's true that the people doing these awful things are shouting Allahu Akbar or whatever, but they are stealing from their own religion to do this and blackening its name. Mm. And, you know, I, I've spent much of tw my 25 years of adult life or more living amongst Muslims in the Middle East and found them to be 
peaceful people. And I know people are going to say, oh my God, that guy's just so starry-eyed or whatever. No, this is fact. But these people have just, they've perverted well, it. Because you were shot by them as well. I mean, yeah, you know, but I mean, mm. some people could accuse me of having some sort of Stockholm syndrome or ah, something. Okay, but, right. you know, I mean, you get all sorts of nonsense yeah. on Twitter, you know, for that, um, f you know, from social media. But mm. it's, a, it's a dangerous juncture because it's really important that society doesn't get polarised now. And there is a perception, I don't know if it's fair or not fair, that, that France's Muslim communities are more alienated from or suspicious of the state mm. than Muslim communities in Britain who are mm. still helping the, the authorities. Uh, and that's partly to do with something very boring, which is planning regulation, which is to do with the fact that if you go to Paris, you have a very white and wealthy uh, 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 central area, and then the banlieue around the outside. You also have the, the relic of the 1967 Algerian War of Independence. Anyone who's ever seen the fantastic mm. film La Haine will know the character Saeed was a sort of relic of that time, and the Coachi brothers, who were responsible for Charlie Hebdo, were kind of a remnant of that. So you have a very different social and geographic structure to London, which I think is much it more interesting. It would be great to see a mass protest by Muslims with mm. not in our name, which is one of the yes. things that was put on one of the, um, the rose... The roses Absolutely. that were left at the Meanwhile, scene. it's all about solidarity and letting life go on. Yeah. And interestingly, the sports pages are also part of the yeah, main Yeah, the story unifying for force of sport. Um, one of the players at, at the French Germany game, Lasana Diara, he lost a cousin in the shootings while, while the match was going on. Um, they're saying here that obviously the match on Wednesday between France and England is going to go ahead and they're going to encourage fans to sing La Marseillaise. Um, I hope they get the players to. A lot of the players can't even sing the national anthem. So the French national they're anthem. Going have, they're <laughs> going to have a rehearsal, to guys. Do, do a bit of, but th this is the story I love the most about sport: is that um, after the match, obviously both sets of players were at the stadium, and nobody knew what was going on, so it was all panic. Uh, and the German team were advised not to go back to their hotel because they didn't know what was going out on the streets. And the French team refused to leave and they stayed with the German team and they all slept Real on mattresses. Solidarity. Real slept, solidarity. Yeah, they slept in mattresses um, through the night. So I thought that was a, a lovely story. Let's talk a little bit about how well Britain is prepared, Frank. Yes, um, which is cue for me to find the... Oh, yes, here's no, the I'm right sorry, paper, I'm, I'm, I'm entirely no, no, my fault. No, I'm not at all, it's just me messing, messing it up. Um, yeah, the secret war, this is uh, in the Sunday Mirror. It's basically about how there are thousands, they say, of undercover operatives monitoring suspects uh, with more police uh, on patrol and that the SES is out on the streets and so on. Um, this comes to the problem of not only the estimated 400 uh, people who've gone out from Britain to Syria and Iraq to, mm -hmm. to, to be with ISIS or with um, Jabhat al-Nusra and come back, but also those who are getting radicalized over the internet, who haven't even gone out there, but are being encouraged over the internet, over Skype or whatever means, by people to carry out attacks here. And they can't monitor everybody. We, yeah. may, we have more CCTV cameras here in Britain than anywhere else in Europe, um, which is one of the reasons it keeps us slightly safer. But I keep hearing warnings from the police and from because government officials. I think, I think the figure, certainly the figure in the Sunday Telegraph, mm. was about 750 British people went out into ISIS-controlled territory. Mm. About 400, roughly speaking, have come mm. back. That's an awful lot of people to follow. And we know that one of the, 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 the bombers, in, the killers in France, mm was known to the police and they just didn't presumably have the resources to follow this guy. What they do over here is they have a triage system. So when they come back, they are assessed essentially by people from the Home Office. What sort of a risk are they? And there is a broad spectrum. There are some people who are coming back completely traumatised, don't want anything to do with it. They've seen horrible things. They made a mistake. They, they, they want to get on with their lives. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's back to whatever job they were doing before. Don't we need to lucky. hear from them? That's what I always think. We, because they come back and then it all goes very quiet. But we need them on television saying, look, I've been out there. This is yeah. not as it is painted. This is not. And we need them know, to be saying that to vulnerable people who are absolutely. susceptible to radicalisation. Absolutely. Okay. But the, 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 just the corollary to that is the other end of that spectrum is that there are people who they haven't got enough evidence to say this person fired an AK or tormented Brit prisoners or whatever, but we think he is really radicalised, and that person is being watched round the clock by people. Mm. Um, the question is, are they getting the prioritisation right? Very, very difficult balance. Finally, Jane, um, one of the issues here is that after Charlie Hebdo, there was a great sort of outpouring of grief, but actually not very much changed in the world. Yeah. You know, uh, now we've got the, the French president using the word war, we are at war, yeah. and the question is, is this going to be like Charlie Hebdo, or is it going to be like 9-11, when the world did change? Yeah, well, interesting. I mean, um, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Hilary Benn, is saying we should not uh, back airstrikes on Syria, and I think this is the first...
Peter Hitchens of the Mail on Sunday agrees with him, um, even though they don't actually know it. Uh, mm. He's saying, if you want to beat terror, you must calm down and think. Use your brain rather mm. than... And, and there is an argument for that, I think, because otherwise you just enter into this endless cycle of violence. But that's right, but the, the, I mean, all of this is happening in the aftermath and the long shadow cast by the Iraq War of 2003. You know, there is a moral and military exhaustion among the West, which is why they don't want to get their hands dirty in Syria. And there's just a practical okay. point, which is that ISIS is full of people that work for Saddam Hussein. Absolutely. Well, listen, I've learned a great deal in the paper review. Thank you, all three, very much indeed. I've been